Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, it's special this week. We're coming from you on location in a break room. <laughs> a bare break room. So I could come look at the construction of our new facility, which is going very well. Apparently, uh, they're pouring cement and there's a possibility we're going to find Jimmy Hoffa's body after all. Anyway, there's some really cool stuff that uh, to talk about. There was a fascinating case that I really wanted to uh, talk about this week of a 72-year-old man from the Netherlands. This is a guy who got infected with uh, COVID and he has a, an immune disorder, blood disorder, uh, and so he, he had a persistent infection for 613 days, which is the longest recorded infection that we, we know about. And the reason it's really important, if you recall, the big changes that we've had in this virus was the um, Omicron, if you'll recall, 30 different mutations and we, from a patient probably originated in South Africa, and then uh, BA 2.86, which is now uh, the, the sort of the ancestor of the one that's currently circulating, uh, that was another 35 or so mutations that was from Denmark. And so, you can see these are happening around the country, but we've never really been able to study them. We just find this virus and we sort of trace it back. But this person, we were able, the, the, the scientists in the Netherlands were able to study him. So one thing about uh, understanding how a virus mutates is it requires time. It requires time in an individual. Every time the virus replicates, the enzyme that causes the, the RNA to be uh, duplicated uh, it, it sometimes misreads. It's like a typist that makes a mistake. And so uh, there are mutations, but usually a person, you know, responds, gets rid of the virus. And so if it passes it on, there's just one mutation or so. But if it sits in a person for a long period of time, like this person, it can accumulate a number of mutations. And we thought that's what happened in a patient in South Africa. We probably thought it was an, probably an HIV positive patient. And then the patient in, uh, in uh, Denmark, we thought was probably a cancer patient or an immune deficient patient. So this is a person who's had a known immune deficiency and prolonged infection. Uh, and it shows how the virus replicating inside a host can accumulate a number of mutations. And that what they did was they sampled him 27 different times and even sequenced the virus all through this process. And what happened was very early on, it became resistant to the antibody treatment, and you're not, not surprised by that. If it changes, if the spike protein changes a little, the monoclonal antibodies that recognize a very specific sequence won't work. And then slowly but surely, they accumulated more and more mutations. And finally, after sequencing it over uh, almost a two-year period, there were 50 uh, known mutations, and it appeared to be very similar to the current BA1 variant that is circulating uh, worldwide. So in other words, it spent all that time in one person's body uh, and it, it changed in a way uh, that could easily become a new major variant. Now in this particular case, the patient did pass away and did not transmit this to other people. But as we've gotten more sophisticated in looking at wastewater analysis, we're finding more and more of these uh, individual viruses, viral sequences have many mutations. So clearly in the community, there are individuals who are having long-term infection, accumulating a lot of uh, mutations in that virus, and this is how all of a sudden one can break out. So that's what happened with BA 2.86, and now it was JN1 and the new ones coming up. If you look at wastewater in the country, though it's look, we have a lot of good news, it's down to very low levels. You can see it's minimal. And as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, the major strain was a BA 2.86, that's the one we talked about, 30 mutations, didn't become very infectious until it required one additional mutation, JN1, and then this new variant required two more mutations, and KP2 is now the dominant strain, 25% versus 22% JN1. So I wanted to ask the question, like, what's it like in the rest of the world? Is this something happening here, or these, this virus coming in from outside? Remember we talked about the world monitoring system that we've set up uh, in the United States to look at airports uh, and people coming in from this country. And there are three things they do. They can do a nasal swab, they can take a, a wastewater from the uh, aircraft, or they, they sample from the triturator, which is this giant repository of wastewater from planes and the terminals. And just to remind you, if you come off a plane and you're visiting the United States, 
you get, uh, you get asked to participate in the SWAB program. This is at many different airports. Uh, several of the airports are collecting wastewater. That I showed you that picture. And then this is what a triturator is. It all, all the wastewater from airplanes and the airport goes into this giant grinder. <laughs> this one's called the Muffin Monster. That's actually its name. I know. Disgusting. Anyway, it then is, uh, we can sample from that, and that gives you an integral view of uh, people uh, in airports and also in airplanes. And then it's either distributed, recycled, or goes to a landfill after it's sterilized. So very interesting, this is the data. And if you look at what's happening uh, from international travelers coming here, it's not as low as the United States. So you can see 10% of the samples are still positive. And if you look at a sequence analysis of those, mostly they're JN1. So the purple is JN1. So m as I mentioned to you, we've <laughs> We have that newest mutation, the KP mutation, uh, but this is mostly JN1. And then the BA1, which is the one that was in that person from Denmark we were just talking about, is still a minority part. So I think that these, this particular mutation probably happened in the United States because it's the dominant strain in the U.S. Uh, and and in, in international travel is still mostly JN1. So to me, it's likely that it originated in the U.S., although it's not 100% sure. So I want to follow up from last week, we, or last week we talked about avian flu, H5N1. Just wanted to show you over the years, the last time we had a really big outbreak was 2014. You can see in 2024, it's not that huge, but we have a fair amount in, in, um, uh, in poultry and in dairy cattle this year. If you look at the sum, we have like almost 10,000 wild birds have been, been infected, but 90 million poultry have been infected with H5N1 in 48 different states. And if you look at dairy cattle, these are the states that are, uh, have all had infected dairy cattle. There are nine different states, um, it could, and so that's, that is a pretty big outbreak. We've only had two people infected. Uh, one was, a, uh, hand, was working in the dairy industry and was probably infected by uh, the cattle there. And then the last time was a person who was also working in the poultry business. So that's all that we've had. So, Still a concern, we're using all the usual flu uh, epidemiology to follow this. Uh, I'll let you know if it becomes a big problem. As I mentioned last time, the CDC is working on getting vaccines ready. We're doing a lot of testing. So I feel like we're pretty prepared for uh, if we suddenly have an outbreak of, of something like avian flu. Um, and, and mostly the COVID news is pretty good. Anyway, I want to end this week oh, with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, this week we celebrate National Nurses Week, which concludes May 12th on Florence Nightingale's birthday. I guess that's why they timed it for that week, yes. Big shout out to all the nurses in our affiliated hospital, those in our local, national, and international communities. Nursing, we couldn't do it without you, so thanks to all the nurses. Uh, you're really important in, our, in the caregiving team. Uh, I also want to th uh, congratulate Dr. Joe Jankovic, professor in the Department of Neurology. He was named the top scholar in movement disorders. This rating was developed by highly ranked scholars, which identifies the most productive research papers uh, of those that have had the most profound impact and high quality. So we already knew Dr. Jankovic was the best, but another, another example of why he's so good. And then finally, of course, it's Mother's Day. I uh, want to wish Happy Mother's Day to everybody, all the mothers out there. Yeah, obviously, how important you are. I uh, hope you have a relaxing weekend. And for all the husbands, I want to remind you that don't tell your wife you're not my mother, which, which is the biggest way to get in trouble. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Happy Mother's Day. Lily is planning on giving a shout out to all the dog moms as well. And so have a wonderful weekend. Can't wait to see you next week.